The study of linear algebra requires an understanding of trigonometry. Indeed, the two are inextricably linked. For that reason, in this video, I'm going to describe the three trigonometric functions you can see here. You'll also see how these well-known trigonometric ratios can be derived. First, think of a circle. And imagine a dot moving around the circumference of the circle. As the dot revolves, it's actually oscillating left and right in the x direction, while at the same time moving up and down in the y direction. Trigonometry allows us to analyse the motion of this dot. In fact, trigonometry was originally developed over 2,000 years ago to explain the motion of stars and planets, albeit with the Earth at the centre of the universe. We can, for example, use trigonometry to calculate the x and y coordinates of the dot as it moves. As you'll see, this in turn will lead to some very useful mathematical techniques. This line is the radius of the circle. It's also the longest side of a right angle triangle within the circle. In fact, as the dot revolves around the centre of the circle, it draws out an infinite number of right angle triangles. For any one of these triangles, there's a right angle of 90 degrees and two acute angles, that is, two angles that measure less than 90 degrees. We will label this acute angle theta. It's the angle through which the dot has moved from its original position. The longest side of this triangle is known as the hypotenuse. Notice that the length of the hypotenuse is the same as the radius of the circle. The other side, which makes up the angle theta, is called the adjacent side because it's next to theta. The third side, which is opposite theta, is called, well, the opposite side. Now, there's something very special about all right angle triangles, no matter how big or small they are. And this becomes apparent if we plot a graph of the angle theta against the ratio of the length of the opposite side to the length of the hypotenuse. Let's work out what this ratio is for an angle of 30 degrees. In order to do this, first notice that this triangle is half of an equilateral triangle, for which all three internal angles are 60 degrees and all three sides have the same length. Let's assume that the opposite side has a length of one unit. It follows that the hypotenuse is two units long. For example, if the opposite side was 100 metres, the hypotenuse would be 200 metres. If the opposite side was 30 inches, the hypotenuse would be 60 inches. So we can conclude that if theta is 30 degrees, the length of the opposite side divided by the length of the hypotenuse is always a half. Here it is plotted on the graph. For an angle of 45 degrees, we can discover the ratio we're looking for using Pythagoras' theorem. We'll relabel the sides of this triangle A, B and C. Pythagoras tells us that A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Because the angle theta is 45 degrees, we can see that A and B have the same length. Let's call this one unit of length. Hence, C is the square root of 2. So, for an angle of 45 degrees, the ratio of the opposite side to the hypotenuse is 1 over root 2, which works out to be about 0 0.707. Let's plot this value on the graph. What about an angle of 60 degrees? Well, notice again that this triangle is half of an equilateral triangle, for which all three sides have the same length. This means that if the length of A is one unit, then the length of C, the hypotenuse, must be two units. Pythagoras tells us that 1 squared plus B squared is equal to 2 squared. So, with a little rearrangement, we find that B is the square root of 3. Hence, for an angle of 60 degrees, the ratio of the opposite side to the hypotenuse is root 3 over 2 
which works out to be about 0.866. Here it is on the graph. As theta gets bigger, the length of the opposite side approaches the length of the radius, and the length of the adjacent side approaches zero. And when our imaginary dot has moved through an angle of 90 degrees, we've actually lost the triangle altogether, because, theoretically, the adjacent side now has a length of zero. But, theoretically, the opposite side is now the same length as the hypotenuse. So the calculation is trivial. For an angle of 90 degrees, we have a ratio of 1 over 1. That's 1. This gives us yet another data point for the graph. As the dot continues to move around the circle, the angle it moves through continues to grow. It's actually this angle we're using to construct the graph. But although the dot has moved 120 degrees from its original position, we have a new right angle triangle with an acute angle of 60 degrees. So we can apply the same reasoning as before to calculate another point for the graph. As the dot continues on its journey around the full 360 degrees of the circle, more points can be added to the graph, and a very distinctive curve begins to emerge. It's called a sine curve, and it's exactly what you would see if you were to plot only the vertical movement of this dot against time as it moves around the circle. Sine curves are used to describe all manner of natural phenomena, such as the movement of water, sound waves, electromagnetic radiation and simple harmonic motion. The sine curve also illustrates a fundamental property of all right angle triangles, namely that for any given angle theta, the ratio of the length of the opposite side to the length of the hypotenuse is always the same. We call this ratio the sine of the angle. Now, suppose for one moment that the circle has a radius of one unit. It follows that the length of the opposite side, divided by 1, is equal to sine theta. For a so-called unit circle, the length of the opposite side is the sine of the angle theta. If we were to move our dot around the whole circle again, examining various triangles as we go, but this time we were to focus on the ratio of the adjacent side to the hypotenuse and how it varied with the angle theta, we generate a different curve. This is called the cosine curve, and it shows that for any given angle theta, the ratio of the length of the adjacent side to the length of the hypotenuse is always the same. We call this the cosine of angle theta, which, by the way, describes the horizontal movement of this dot as it revolves. Furthermore, for a circle with a radius of one unit, we can relabel the adjacent side of this triangle as cosine theta. There's a third trigonometric function worthy of mention now namely tangent. The word tangent derives from the Latin word tangere, meaning to touch. Strictly speaking, a tangent is a line touching a curve at a single point, and that line has the same slope as the curve at the point of contact. This line is the tangent of the point at which the hypotenuse of the triangle also touches the circle. Notice that the tangent line is perpendicular to the hypotenuse and if we extend the adjacent side of the triangle then we've constructed a new, larger right angle triangle. And in trigonometry it's the line segment that makes up the opposite side of this triangle that we refer to as the tangent of theta. To derive an expression for the tangent of theta in terms of the lengths of the sides of any right angle triangle, first notice that for the big triangle, theta is still 30 degrees, the same as the original triangle within the circle.
We already know that, for any right-angled triangle, the ratio of the length of the adjacent side to the length of the hypotenuse is the cosine of theta. And we also know that the adjacent side of the large triangle has a length of 1, because it's the radius of a unit circle. So we can say that the cosine of theta is 1 over the length of the hypotenuse of the large triangle, and therefore the length of the hypotenuse is 1 over the cosine of theta. Given that the sine of theta is the length of the opposite side over the length of the hypotenuse, we can say that sine theta multiplied by the length of the hypotenuse is equal to the length of the opposite side. Hence, sine theta over cosine theta is the length of the opposite side. As we've already said, the opposite side of the large triangle is, by definition, the tangent of theta. And we've already shown, for the original triangle, sine theta is the length of the opposite side, and cosine theta is the length of the adjacent side. So we have a new rule. The tangent of theta is the length of the opposite side over the length of the adjacent side. Here's the tangent for various values of theta plotted on the graph. Some of these values can also be derived by analysing triangles, in the same way that we did for sine and cosine. It's a peculiar looking curve, but if you think about it, as theta gets ever smaller, the length of the line segment we refer to as the tangent approaches zero. On the other hand, as theta gets ever larger, the length of the tangent approaches infinity. These trigonometric functions have been used for centuries in the fields of astronomy, geography, science and engineering. It's believed that even the ancient Egyptians used them to measure the heights of the pyramids as they were being built. Finally, here's a summary of the well-known trigonometric ratios, many of which you've already met and will almost certainly meet again if you study quantum mechanics or quantum computing.